Hey everyone, it's Franz from MapMastery. This is the first video in a mini-series on important trial results. Today we're going to talk about the optimal duration of dual antiplatelet therapy following stent implantation. The study that we're going to cover was published by Iliano Pio Navarese, and I find that name really, really cool, and I hope that you'll find the study just as cool. Have fun! The study's title is Optimal Duration of Dual Antiplatelet Therapy After Percutaneous Coronary Intervention with Drug-Eluting Stents, Meta-Analyses of Randomized Controlled Trials. That's a pretty long title there. The study was published in the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, in April 2015. Now what is dual antiplatelet therapy? As you probably know, that's a combination of aspirin with either clopidogrel also known as Plavix, Prazogrel, or Affiant, or Ticagrelor, or Brilic. The combination of these drugs following stent implantation is well established. However, the optimal duration of dual antiplatelet therapy is less clear. The American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association recommend giving a combination of therapy for at least 12 months, whereas the European Society of Cardiology recommends 6 to 12 months. So, who's right? In a quest to shed some more light on this question, Navarese and co-workers set out to perform a meta-analysis. What is a meta-analysis? Well, it's kind of like a study of studies. While well, you would search various databases for trials that meet certain inclusion criteria, then you'd lump them together using some fancy statistical tools in order to arrive at a summary of all the included studies. Some people think that meta-analyses is to analyses what metaphysics is to physics, but that's a discussion that I really don't want to get into in this video. I think they're actually pretty useful. So let's get back to Navarese et al. I like that name. And check out what they've done and found. In fact, they searched a plethora of databases between January 2001 and February 2015 for randomized clinical trials comparing either short dual antiplatelet therapy of below 12 months to a duration of 12 months. But that's not all. They also looked for trials that compared long-term treatment of over 12 months with 12 months of therapy. So all in all, there were three different groups in the identified studies. There were those patients that received dual therapy for less than 12 months, those that received it for 12 months, and those that received it for more than 12 months. The analyses only included trials of drug-eluting stents. Bare metal stents and PTCA only were excluded. Their search identified 338 trials, of which 328 were deemed ineligible. So they ended up with a total of 10 trials that included 32,287 patients. Pretty impressive number, right? There were 16,116 patients in the 12-month group, which was basically the comparison group, 7,975 in the short-term group, and 8,196 in the long-term group. Seven studies compared short-term to 12 months, and three studies compared long-term to 12 months. 48% of patients had stable angina, 45% had non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes, and 7% had STEMI an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now, the result or output, if you will, of a meta-analysis is usually a so-called odds ratio. If the odds ratio and its confidence interval are below 1, the outcome is less likely in the treatment group, and when the odds ratio and its confidence interval are above 1, the outcome is more likely in the treatment group. If the confidence interval crosses 1, the value of unity, this means that the effect is not statistically significant. The odds ratio and its confidence interval can be depicted by a dot with a horizontal line as seen here, or also as a little diamond. Now, the authors looked at a couple of different outcomes. They looked at all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, and major bleeding. And here's what they found. Let's talk about the comparison of short-term therapy versus 12 months of therapy first. Let me draw the odds ratios and the confidence intervals first. Now, as you can see, there's only one odds ratio and its associated confidence interval that's significant, and that's the one for major bleeding. As you probably remember, 
since the odds ratio is below one, this means that the outcome is less common or less likely in the intervention group. And the intervention group here is the short-term treatment group. So less bleeding in the short-term treatment group. There was no significant difference when it comes to all of the other endpoints. So I'm sure you agree, but this comparison clearly favors short-term treatment as compared to 12 months of treatment. Now let's switch to the other comparison of extended treatment versus 12 months of therapy. What's going on here? What about all-cause mortality? Well, there was a summary odds ratio of 1.3. You see that the confidence interval doesn't cross one, so it's statistically significant. This means that death of any cause was more common in the extended therapy group. Bad, right? What about cardiovascular mortality? Here, the odds ratio was 1.09, but not statistically significant. What about myocardial infarction? The odds ratio for that was 0.53, which was statistically significant. So what this means is that the odds of myocardial infarction were reduced by 47% in the extended treatment group. So that's good. Let's look at stent thrombosis. That was also significantly reduced with an odds ratio of 0.33, so a 67% reduction. Again, a good outcome for the long-term treatment group. And what about major bleeding? That was significantly elevated in the extended treatment group with an odds ratio of 1.62, so a 62% increase in the odds for developing bleeding. So bad, right? So bad, good, good, bad for the extended treatment group. What should we make of this? Maybe the number needed to treat can help us out. What is the number needed to treat, or also called the number needed to harm for adverse events? Well, that number says how many patients would need to be treated in order to prevent an event or cause an event. We're not going to look at the short versus 12 months results because that's pretty straightforward. There, it looks very much in favor of short-term treatment. But what about the extended treatment versus 12-month comparison? Here are the events where statistical significance was reached. All-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, stent thromboses, and major bleeding. So what are the numbers needed to treat or harm here? All-cause mortality was increased in the extended treatment group, so here it would be a number needed to harm as indicated by the red ink. Here, for every 238 patients that are treated longer than 12 months, there'd be one death that comes with it. Myocardial infarction was decreased in the extended treatment group, so this is a number needed to treat, as denoted in green, and we'd have to treat 75 patients in order to prevent one MI. What about stent thrombosis? That was also prevented by extended therapy and we'd need to treat 152 patients in order to prevent one case of stent thrombosis. And finally, major bleeding. The number needed to harm here is 135, meaning that for every 135 patients that are treated for more than 12 months, there'd be one case of major bleeding. So let's assume we'd be treating 1,000 patients with the extended therapy. We'd be causing 4.2 deaths, we'd prevent 13.3 myocardial infarctions and 6.6 .6 stent thromboses, and we'd be causing 7.4 major bleeds. One thing you'd have to be aware of when looking at these numbers is that myocardial infarction and stent thromboses are not mutually exclusive, meaning that there's overlap. You wouldn't prevent 13.3 plus 6.6 .6 events, but probably less than that. So in summary, the authors concluded that the extended therapy should probably be reserved to patients at very high ischemic risk, but very low bleeding risk. They also said that according to their data, the 12-month treatment recommendation seems less appealing than either an extended therapy or a short-term therapy when it comes to reducing bleeding risk or increasing the anti-ischemic properties. I think this study is really important and it will leave its footprint on the guidelines for sure. And I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. What do you think of these data. Do you want to know more of that kind of studies? Do you want to learn about different studies? What is it you want to learn about? I'd be really interested. Also, don't forget to check out our brand new website and our brand new acid base course. With this being said, I wish you all the best, have a great day, and I hope to talk to you soon.